you're viewing a message from the pulpit of Rolling Hills Church, located in Verona, Pennsylvania. We're glad that you could join us as we open up the Word of God. Prayer is not just about what is being said. It is primarily about the connection, the closeness, the communion that we experience with Him. Wanted to let you guys know that there were lots of things that, that happened throughout this past week. Uh, this particular facility was completely different. If you were here during the week, you saw how we were set up for VBS, and I'm always amazed at how quickly we can make that turnaround from VBS week back to uh, worship on a Sunday. And I want to thank once again all of our volunteers for an outstanding uh, VBS. I want to thank the, uh, the two uh, points that, that helped with leading it, Nicole Dreyer and Jody Hazinski. Um, I, I would echo exactly what they would say, and it's obviously it's something that takes a lot more than just two people. In fact, I believe we had 44 volunteers. Um, so that was, that was wonderful to see so many people serving, and they were able to serve, was the final number 73? Okay, so 77 different kids throughout the week. Uh, or how many we had at VBS. So it was a wonderful week of ministry. We have a quick video we're going to show. Once again, those that were at VBS get to hear this song one more time. Um, so here's the video. Now, since we are not having a kid's time, we, will, we do still have a treat for you guys, though. So Nicole here is going to stand off to the side if the kids want to kind of make their way forward indiscreetly and, uh, and grab a snack. And I would also ask that our ushers would make their way forward um, as we prepare to give of our tithes and our offerings. Will you join me once again in prayer? God, we thank you for this time, and we pray now as we turn to your word that you would speak to us, that we would see um, how you are moving, how you are giving us your Holy Spirit to move us ever closer to you. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be open to the words that we hear, that they would be your words and not mine, and that you would be glorified through all that we do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, so once again this morning, wanted to begin by welcoming Alex and his family to Rolling Hills Church. I think that there are a number of ways in which uh, he will use uh, Alex and Marcy in, in ministry here at Rolling Hills. Um, but one thing that is very important and something that we always need to be mindful of and that's allowing people of all ages um, to be leaders here. We do not do this at the expense of older people or anything like that, but we should remember that a church ages itself naturally. And so unless we are intentional in reaching younger people and in reaching younger families, um, someday we're going to wake up and it'll be just a bunch of old people here. And you know what comes next. So we don't want that. So I'm excited to see younger people here. I'm excited to, to be able to have the opportunity to provide leadership to those that are younger. And I am also very saddened by the fact that I am now old enough to look at people in their 30s and say, look at those young people. Isn't that cute? Um, so with that in mind, I hope that you are planning on sticking around and being a part of, of our picnic 
after the worship time is concluded. Uh, they will be here. You'll be able to maybe have some time with them and, and just get to meet them. Uh, there's a lot of really good food being prepared right now. Uh, there were a number of people that brought other dishes and everything, so there's plenty of food. Please plan to stick around. But today, we're not talking about whippersnappers or anything like that. Instead, we are going to continue our walk through the book of Matthew. But I wanted to start by asking a question. And if you've ever tried doing, well, tell me if, if you can, if this has ever happened with you when you've tried to uh, do a, a remodeling project in your house, if you can relate to this. Our family, when we moved into the house that we live in now, uh, we needed to do some major updating in it. We bought the house as an estate sale. And because the previous owners had spent the last number of their years uh, in, in poor health, it had been at least 20 years before anything was done to the house. So we had the typical nicotine stains on the wall. You know, you walk in and it's instead of white walls, or they're kind of like this yellowish hue to it. Uh, we had those. We had outdated wallpaper and, and chipping paint on, on all the painted surfaces. But the problem that we ran into, because our home is over 160 years old, my wife and I, we, we like old houses. We like the, uh, the character that old homes have. We were running into all of the previous remodeling attempts by the many previous owners. Um, one of the rooms, we, we wanted to have the children's rooms ready before we moved in. And so, as I began prepping Caleb's room for the paint job, I started to pull off the wallpaper. And as I'm pulling off the wallpaper, I see another layer of wallpaper. And so I start to pull that wallpaper off, and then I see another layer of wallpaper. Until I found five layers of wallpaper. Um, by the time I made it to the fifth layer, chunks of the wall, and this wasn't drywall back then, this was horsehair plaster. Chunks of the wall are coming off as I'm pulling off the wallpaper. So I just like neatly put it back in place. Um, and we painted over the wallpaper. Like it's, there's probably an inch of wallpaper, it seems, in, these, in this room. What, I, what was supposed to turn into a nice, easy project, in reality, became um, a, a major pain to me because I'm dealing with drywall. There was a hole. They, they did, I don't know how many of you have done this where you have a hole in your wall and rather than fix it, you put the picture over the hole. <laughs> this hole was like this big and there was nothing I could do other than try to get some drywall in there and I'm not that good at mudding and all that stuff. So it, it was, it was a, a major job for me. And life is kind of like that sometimes, is it not? You start down one path, you think things are going to be nice and easy if I go this way and then suddenly things begin to change. Sometimes they change for the better, other times they change for the worse. But our lives at some point that we have to begin to focus on something else, something other than what we wanted to focus on, and what we thought the outcome would be in reality becomes very different. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Matthew starting in verse 21, Matthew, uh, fifth, I'm sorry, Matthew 15, verse 21 through 28. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. 
Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done as, for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. So in our reading the, uh, this morning, we, we hear about Jesus and his disciples leaving for this area called Tyre and Sidon. And a lot of things occurred leading up to this point. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about Jesus' cousin, uh, John the Baptist, who was be uh, beheaded. Jesus feeding 5,000 plus people with uh, some loaves and, and some fish. Um, and then he walks on water right after that. All of these events took place around the area of the Sea of Galilee. And then in Matthew 15, we pick up the story of Jesus teaching about what is clean and what is unclean. Some of the Pharisees and the other teachers of the law were present at that time of that teaching, and Jesus uh, was pointing directly at them, basically saying, do not be like them. <clears throat> do not be like them. Instead, be clean from the inside out. Jesus is teaching what is what truly makes someone clean and what really defiles someone. And his boiled down version is that it is what comes out of us is what defiles us. The things we say, the, the things we do, not the things that we allow in. And this upset the Pharisees. Now let me take a sidetrack here and maybe explain why there was so much animosity towards Jesus at this time. About 150 years prior to the time of Jesus, uh, there was a family that led a revolt against the empire, the Seleucid Empire that was occupying Israel at the time. And a family by the name of Maccabees, if you have a uh, the, the Bible with a few extra books in it, you'll see that they have these books and they're called Maccabees. And the, the books of Maccabees detail these particular events. So this, this family called the Maccabees lead a revolt against the Seleucids after the emperor whose name was Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, stop there for a second. As Christians, we celebrate, some Christians around the world, they celebrate this thing called Epiphany, the day of Epiphany. It's when God was manifested or revealed as Jesus Christ to the Magi. So the term Epiphany came to mean something uh, to someone. The, the historical rev or relevance of it is that God is revealing himself as a divine being. So here you have this emperor, his name is Antiochus Epiphanes. He is saying, I am God. This is kind of what the Israelites are dealing with. So Antiochus was so certain that he was God that he had his name changed to remind everybody, my name is Antiochus, I am God kind of thing. The Jews did not care for this. Uh, they normally do not like when people walk around claiming to be God, but what drove them to the point of rebellion, um, after the, 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 the priesthood became a little too political for Antiochus, he pillaged the temple, and he attacked Jerusalem. He took some of the women and the children captive, but that did not lead to rebellion yet. Um, what Antiochus then began to do is to start moving against the Jewish faith, and he started to Hellenize it, turn it into something that was more Greek. Uh, he began to ban what were the normal Jewish traditions. In 167 BC, Jewish sacrifice was forbidden. Uh, Sabbaths and feasts were, were banned, and circumcision was outlawed. Altars to Greek gods were set up all around Israel at the time. Uh, animals were prohibited from being sacrificed. They took a statue of Zeus, brought him into the Holy of Holies, and placed him in the temple in the Holy of Holies. That is what set the Jews off. And so they then began this, uh, this period of revolt. And eventually, they were able to gain their freedom over the Romans. But it became a, a source of pride for people when they would say, my family fought in the rebellion against Antiochus uh, in order to defend the Mosaic law. That was a source of pride for a lot of families. And so 
all of a sudden, this is only 150 years ago, two generations later, you have this guy that comes along that is saying these things that seem to go against the Mosaic law. Oh, you don't have to wash your hands anymore. You don't have to do this. Um, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were very upset about it because their great-grandfather died for the right for a Jew to go to temple and to offer these sacrifices. And now you have Jesus saying something. He comes along and he says, by the way, someday we're going to destroy the temple. So you can see how so many people were upset with Jesus at the time. So getting back to our story, some people have speculated that this confrontation with the Pharisees is what made Jesus and, the, and his followers leave Roman Palestine, Israel, and begin to venture out into areas where there were, get this, non-Jewish people there. This was a big deal. They were going to the barbarians. They were going to Gentiles now. They were going to our people, if you will. And up until this time, Jesus' ministry had taken place amongst the Jews. And there were a couple of occasions where he healed Gentiles, but it happened in Jewish territory. Now he is headed the furthest away from home that he has ever been in his adult life, at least as far as we know. So as I pointed out, Jesus was near the Sea of Galilee, and he is headed to this other region that's about 25 to 50 miles away. Uh, to put that into distances, we might understand if you're at the point in downtown Pittsburgh and you begin walking this way, you will walk all the way to Blairsville, roughly, is, is the 50-mile the, the range from downtown Pittsburgh. Are things different in Blairsville than they are in downtown Pittsburgh. They were, they are now, and things were much different as they, uh, back then. And Jesus is facing this different culture now that he is moving out into this new territory. Things were beginning to change. And I know that Jesus was God, but how could things be changing for him? He is supposed to know everything, and he does know everything, but his ministry is now beginning to change. So all we know from reading this account, we don't know whether or not they made it there to the area. Um, we, we know that he made it to the region. Whether he made it into the city, we're not sure. The parallel account is found in Mark chapter 7. And there it's written that Jesus went into a house Again, we're not sure where the house was located, but either way, Jesus and his disciples are headed to the region, and this woman approaches them. Her daughter was demon-possessed, possessed to the point of being ill from it. And so the account we have here that I just read this morning should be a very troubling story for us to read because it doesn't seem to fit Jesus' ministry. Even though what happens here happens to you and me all of the time. You have this woman coming and crying out before God, and Jesus is silent to her. Here she is coming to Christ, not even for something for herself, but for someone else. This is a nice thing to do. This is a right thing to do. And I hear uh, uh, from a few people how when they talk about their prayer lives, they always say, well, I don't pray for things for myself, which I don't quite understand but it at least shows a humbleness of heart. So here's this mother crying out to God, and God ignores her, or at least he seems to ignore her. And in fact, it was so um, powerful, I guess, that the, 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 the apostles, when they were asking Jesus to send her away, it's this Greek word, apoluo, it can also be translated as set free. So what they may have been asking her uh, of Jesus is, you know, this woman keeps crying. She keeps yelling and about her daughter. Just give her what she wants. Just do it, God. Do it, Jesus. You, you are able of doing this. Grant what she is asking. But Jesus remains silent. And instead, he begins addressing people other than the one who is crying out to him. 
and he begins talking about lost sheep and all this other stuff. And he is speaking to his disciples, and the woman comes and kneels before Jesus and says, will you help me? Now, Jesus, being the nice, mellow, peaceful, good guy, hippie-type Jesus, grants her her wish, correct? He calls her a dog. And again, because of cultural differences, it's not like, hey, what's up, dog, you know, kind of thing. It's nothing like that. You know, it's kind of a nice thing when we greet each other, yo, what up, dog? And because of the, the general position that dogs have in our households, a lot of people are like, well, that's, that's cute, call someone a dog. People, in an attempt to make Jesus seem nicer, because they didn't like this idea of Jesus calling a woman a dog, they've, they've come up with all these things about, well, no, he didn't really call her a dog, he called her a puppy, you know, which is kind of like a, a cute pet, you know, someone that needs help, and all of this other stuff. Jesus called this woman a dog at the time but there is a point to it. So here's where things get even more in interesting. The woman actually plays along with Jesus' words and actually adds to it by saying, even the dogs get some crumbs off the tables. So what is happening here, and I believe what is happening is the, the, the point of the story. And I, but I wanna look at it from two different perspectives. You can certainly read this account of this woman and come away thinking that as followers of Christ, we need to be persistent. This woman was certainly that. She simply would not give up. Parents, if you are praying for your child, for your children, do you ever reach the point where you're like, okay, that's enough? We pray constantly for them. She would not give up. She would not be ignored even after possibly or seemingly being rejected. She kept persisting in asking Jesus, will you heal my daughter? Persistence in prayer is necessary. I've been praying for different members in my family for 20 plus years for them to be redeemed. And to this day, opportunities will occasionally arise where I have a chance to sit down and talk with them about why I believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, Nicole and I have been praying for our children and their friends and, and their someday wives and husband uh, ever since the day they were born. I was praying for Nicole years before I uh, even met her. So, yes, we need to be persistent in our prayers. We cannot give up in praying, uh, or more specifically, communing with God. But what was Jesus doing when he was ignoring this woman uh, and, and speaking only to the disciples? You have this woman that's over here yelling and screaming, Jesus, will you help me? Jesus, will you help me? And you can almost picture it where he turns his back to her and begins addressing his disciples. What Jesus is doing and what God is doing to us sometimes when he seems to be silent is that he is pulling this woman closer to him. She was off on the periphery. Uh, she was yelling and making this commotion. And if Jesus did speak at that time, how many times have you felt when you're praying and you're so vocal towards God and God, you can almost picture in heaven going, oh, uh, let me get a word in kind of thing. But we're so busy praying and saying things to God by being silent and speaking away from her, God forced this woman to move. And so maybe that's where we are. Maybe we have been yelling at God from afar. And you wonder, well, why isn't God answering me? I keep yelling. I keep saying things to him. I keep talking with him. He looks at our situation and he says, I cannot even talk to you right now because where you are, you would never be able to hear me. Come closer. Let him draw you into that intimate relationship with him. Prayer is not just about what is being said. It is primarily about the connection, the closeness, the communion that we experience with him. And so while we may read this and think that this woman um, would not take no for an answer, 
I believe that she would not allow anything to stand in between her and an opportunity to, to be with Christ. Or maybe she was so consumed by her concerns, she forgot to stop and listen for God to say something. And so she needed to move to be closer to him. So be persistent in our prayers. Be persistent in our desire to talk to God. Be persistent in our desire to be with him and to realize that when it comes to speaking to God, sometimes we just need to sit silently before him and allow him to speak. But there was something else that's happening here. And as I stated earlier, this was the first time during Jesus' ministry that he had ventured outside of Jewish territory. Up until this time, Jesus was ministering primarily to Jews. Now, the scope of the ministry was beginning to expand to include Gentiles or all people. So in the parallel account found in Mark 7, we read that after this event, after this, this Canaanite woman confronted Jesus, Jesus then takes his apostles and they move to this other place called the Decapolis, which is another primarily Gentile region. Jesus is leaving the area of the Jews, Jews behind and bringing his gospel now to the Gentiles. Things were changing. And we as Christians, a lot of times, we do not like change, do we? I mean, anymore, it seems like in our society, you, we're forced to deal with change. A lot of times, the Christian's response to change is grab on and, and hold on because society is changing so fast anymore. If we could just have some consistency in church, that would be nice. And so what ends up happening is change within the church becomes very uncomfortable. It makes us have to give up things that we once believed in, that we once uh, worked in, that are no longer being effective. Uh, the scariest part of change for a lot of Christians is that something might actually work that someone else came up with. So that means that there will be, with change, there's going to be new people. And, you know, the, the problem is I like my group of people. I come to worship and I know the people that are going to be here. And if I have to start meeting new people, you're just asking me to do way too much. I just want to come and be comfortable and know what's happening around me. And I bet the disciples felt a lot like this. When they first started in their ministry with Jesus, Jesus poured all of this time and attention into them. And then they were with their own people. They were with people that they understood. They could talk about things, and everybody would get what they were talking about. But then as time went on, Jesus' ministry began to expand beyond those circles, and his time with his disciples began to diminish. And so it's human nature, and for a lot of people, that human nature breeds jealousy in some way. So if you come here to worship or any other kind of ministry here, and you are able to receive encouragement from those who have been a part of your lives or the life of this church for a while, praise God for that. And I mean that. Praise God, because that is a wonderful thing to be able to experience friendships and relationships within the church. We all need those kind of relationships. But, you know, the other part of it is I wasn't one of those ones that, that grew up in a church. My parents weren't the ones sitting next to you in the pew. And so what it took was someone leaving their seats in the church and coming out and speaking to me and inviting me into the church. I needed people who were willing to risk their relationships, to risk the things and leave things behind, the things that they knew, the things that they were comfortable with. They needed to leave all of that and to, to venture out and to say to me, you know what, Greg, there is a better way. There is the way and his name is Jesus Christ. And I am thankful for people like that who were obedient to God and were willing to not let their relationship with him to be a secret. So you see, Jesus was ministering in a small context. 
He had a, a closed group of people that he would minister to. And by the way, I'm not trying to say that, that Jesus was wrong to minister to the quote-unquote lost sheep of Israel. I believe that in his ministry, he set an example to us. His ministry started with those people, with those that he was comfortable around, and look at what happened by the end of Matthew. It starts with the Jews, and then you have Jesus saying to his followers, now go out into the entire world and make disciples of all humans, of all people. See, it was no longer a secret. It was no longer something that was meant for them alone. So please do not simply try to, to, to dismiss this as, well, you know, that's something that I'm supposed to say because I'm the pastor. No, I lived it. Before I was working in a church, I had a real job, like all of you, and in that real job, everybody that I worked with knew that I was a believer. And it's not because I wore a t-shirt that said, uh, God is wiser instead of Budweiser or anything like that. It's because I was vocal in my faith, because I recognized that this is sharing the gospel is not something that is meant for just the pastor. We are all called to be ministers of the gospel. And that means I share Christ, I talk about Him. So the ministry is beginning to change. The focus was changing from the lost sheep of Israel to the world. And this was a radical change in the ministry and the work of God in this world. This woman who is used by God to illustrate his real love, his real power, his ability to take us all and redeem us into his own creation was being displayed through what he was doing through this woman. So here she is, seemingly being ignored, rejected, and meanwhile, something great is about to happen. We are all welcomed into the ministry of the gospel now. So, Next time you think that, well, God is just being silent to me, and then you begin to be quiet and actually move towards God and ask Him, what are you saying? What are you really saying to me? Understand that there might be something great that is about to happen. If Jesus is our example, then what are we doing to welcome more people into this kind of life, that we are taking this gospel, that we are taking um, God's direction to us and bringing it out into people and, to, and being able to say to them, do you know that God himself is speaking to you, but you need to be quiet. You need to move towards God and listen to him. Did you ever leave something behind only to find something greater? Do you ever come to a time where a decision needs to be made that is going to change your life? It can be a very scary place to live in, but God is always moving. He is moving us as individuals. He is moving us as a congregation uh, into new areas of ministry. God calls us as his church to leave behind sometimes the things that we know, the things that we are comfortable with, and really begin reaching out to other people, to be the ones that are willing to serve in ministry, not just talk about it, but really bringing the ministry to people. God is moving, and he wants to do something great through us. Are we willing to follow him? Or are we going to try and get ahead of him and turn him around and say, no, God, you know, I really liked the way things were back then. When I first started coming to this church, that's when I really liked it. And now things are changing, and I just don't know how to, how to deal with all of this. We like familiarity. Here, God, is where I want to stay. I don't want to be stretched. Where are we today, though? Is God calling you to, to maybe come closer to him? Does it seem like he is so far away that you are yelling for him and we cannot hear him? Then it's time for us to come closer. Maybe he is leading you to a place where your life 
needs to be radically changed. Maybe he wants you to broaden your focus and to see those people around you. See the people around you who need hope, who need love, who need genuine concern and inspiration. Maybe he is calling you to radically change the way you spend your time. Are there things that you should be doing? Are there things that you should not be doing? And God is calling you, change those now. Maybe he is calling you to begin serving with other people in a ministry. Uh, many of you already do. Maybe it's time to radically change and find ways that you can become involved. That you've heard me talk about it time and time again now, that Rolling Hills Church is not a Sunday church. There is much more to the life of this church than what happens from 10 to 11.30 on a Sunday morning. Maybe it's time that you begin to experience those things, to move beyond where you're sitting in your chair right now and to really ask God, where else can I experience you in this church? Maybe it's time to begin meeting with someone that you can become accountable to and begin discipling them. It is a clear command from God that he wants to, us to do that. But the other part is, maybe now that you've been meeting with somebody, now it's time to leave what is familiar to you and to venture out and to find someone who needs the gospel and begin discipling that person. Are we being obedient in this? Are we continuing in our desire to be a lone wolf kind of Christian, the one that thinks, no, it's okay, I can do this by myself. After all, I, I watch a sermon or two on TV, and I, I listen to Word or Caleb occasionally, and that should be enough. That's not enough. We need so much more than that. There are other people in this church that actually want to sit down across from you and talk and get to know you, and be accountable to you, and learn things from you, and allow you to learn things from them. What if God is calling you into something different? But the only way we can hear that difference is us being quiet, no longer coming up with excuses, no longer giving God and, or saying to God, here's my commands, here's the things that I need you to do for me. He might do those things, but instead he's being quiet towards us because he wants us to come closer to him and to commune with him. So this morning, as a response to the message, we have an opportunity to participate in communion. I think we're going to do it a little bit differently because we're leaving the past behind and the things that we're familiar with. So when we do communion here, um, we're going to be silent. God, through Jesus Christ, he gave his life to us and he gave us direction in how to celebrate communion. Paul writes these words in 1 Corinthians, but in the following instructions I do not commend you because when you come together it is not for the better but for the worse. For in the first place when you come together as a church I hear that there are divisions among you and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another goes, gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I would ask that uh, those that are helping to serve communion would make their way forward. And once we begin handing out the elements, that we would remain in, a, in an attitude of prayer and silence and expecting God to communicate to us. Gracious Lord, we thank you that in this act of communion that you call us closer to you. God, I know I am sorry for the times that I allow my life to, um, to scream out for me and to yell out and to not allow me to hear you. I'm sorry for the times that um, in my concerns, whether they are for myself or for others, but in those concerns, I do not stop and hear you. God, we repent of that, and we pray that you would enable us to hear you, to move towards you, to come into communion with you as we proclaim the glorious gift that you have given us through your death and your resurrection. God, may we be willing to move ever closer to you, to be silent before you, and to know that you are speaking and that you are about to do something magnificent something that we never would have thought possible. God, when you called this woman to, be, to, to come into um, closer proximity to you, you were changing the world. You were allowing people like me to come to you now. So God, though your silence can, from, can sometimes be deafening to us, we pray that we would be able to get to the point that even in, in the silence, God, that, that we still would have faith in you and that we would continue to move ever closer to you so that we may hear you, Lord. That we can hear that still, small voice, that whisper in the wind. God, we thank you and we love you. And it's in your precious Son's name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Visit us on the web at www.rollinghillschurch.today or drop in for a visit at 120 Garner Drive, Verona, PA, 15147. Service time is 10 a.m. on Sunday. Send us a message via email to rollinghillsbaptist at comcast.net or reach us by phone at 412-795-1133.